Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you doing? We are already in November now. I can't believe it. We're very close to the end of 2022. Hmm. How's the weather where you're at? I don't know. Weather fascinates me. I live in California. I don't think I could live where there's weather. Today's episode is really interesting. We touch on a bunch of topics, but the main focus is what do you tell yourself about what you're feeling? And Jen and I talk about language matters. Jen loves to talk about holding everything with a question mark. The stories that we tell ourselves matter. When do we process? When do we not process? We end up talking about creativity and Jen talks about Gabor Mate and four things that he says that we all need. Then we talk about creativity and having it be okay to make mistakes. We talk about, especially with HSPs, that we often are very externally focused on productivity and our culture is very much about doing and being a highly sensitive person. Our skills are often very much about being and our presence, which is not as easy to measure. I don't know. I think that this is a great episode where we cover a lot of things that I think are going to be really relatable. So I think that's all I have. And now on to the show. Hey, Jen, how are you? Hi, Patricia. How am I? A little harried. I've had quite the few days of running around. Lots of extra trips to pick up homework binders and stuff like that. Yeah. (laughs) Well, your life is very busy. You have lots of moving pieces. Yes. Yeah, nothing nothing has crashed on the floor just yet. That's That's good. That's good. That's good. Well, part of what we're going to talk about is like when you asked how I am and really I'm fine, but I wanted to say like, I don't know, I'm feeling like irritable, depressed, and there's really nothing going on. And what it is, is my husband had surgery yesterday and maybe we'll talk about he's fine. It was outpatient surgery, but that brought up a lot of my attachment injuries. And I did some numbing behaviors on Sunday because of fear that something would happen to him. And yesterday, just waiting to make sure he was okay because... I love my husband and don't want anything to happen to him. And my mind was going to what would happen if something happened. And I've been watching this series called Heartland on Netflix, which I love. And really my coping mechanism right now, and I love it, is like, I just want to watch my show. And so Mm -hmm. the reality is I got up and walked the dog and did the things I needed to do this morning. And then I was watching Heartland before we recorded. And normally I'm paddling on Wednesdays, but I didn't paddle this morning. So it's just that my brain is in, I just want to be watching Heartland. I don't really want to show up for any other parts of my life right now. And I'm not depressed and I'm not irritable, but it's that thing of like, I just want to do what I want to do. What you and I were talking about is, I think often how we interpret and what we tell ourselves about how we're feeling can really make a huge difference. And, you know, me being able to go like, everything's fine. There's just been a lot going on and I just want a little Heartland time. (laughs) Yes. But if I didn't have that awareness, I'd probably go into this narrative about how stressful my life is and how terrible things are. And like, really, everything's okay. We've had a lot of things going on. Oh, absolutely. Language matters. Mm -hmm. It really, Mm -hmm. really matters in such big ways. It's funny. It's a topic this morning with several clients looking at what language we use to shape what's going on. And keeping in mind, like holding, I love holding everything with a question mark, right? Mm -hmm. Like my motto, (laughs) what the bleep do I know? But even how we're framing it, anything. Well, and I think too, the ability to have the awareness about what's going on and to be able to see the larger context and to have gathered enough evidence to know that how I'm feeling in this moment may not be the reality. I'm thinking yesterday morning, I was sending you a polo while Steve was in surgery and I realized with all the trauma that I have from my childhood and not having anybody help me through that and not having processed through that, those trauma responses were coming up. And then my mom's computer wasn't working. She lost all her files and she counts on me to, I looked at it, we need to take it in. But 
I was telling her I'll bring it in today. I'm like, I didn't have time to bring it in yesterday. I had to get my husband from surgery and tend to him. But I was having this very overwhelming sense, which is from my childhood, that there was just like too much going on and I wouldn't be able to manage. And as I was talking to you, I reminded myself like, okay, what's in front of me? Okay, I need to walk the dogs. I'm going to go to my water fitness class. The thing with my mom can wait till tomorrow. She's being very patient. What does the rest of today look like? What does tomorrow look like? And by the time I was done talking to you, I'd talk myself down because those feelings of panic and overwhelm and kind of catastrophic thinking were rising. And then it's like, oh, this is just a moment. I'm okay. And really from that moment on, that sense of overwhelm really dissipated. I still had feelings of concern and fear about, you know, him coming out of surgery and being okay. But that was realistic because I didn't have that information yet. So this is just another instance of when trauma, history, unresolved things come up, there's actual stressful things going on. How do we manage what we're feeling and what do we tell ourselves about it? And you and I connected a number of times yesterday because I just felt like I needed that sense of grounding and connection because I felt dysregulated. It was scary. Like it was just scary. And when you reflected to me how scary it was, I got tearful and then didn't want to respond to you because... I didn't really want to open up this whole wounding thing because like my husband hadn't died yet. I didn't have to plan for his funeral and how I was going to care for the animals and deal with all the things like, but that's where my head wanted to go. But you know, when do we open that stuff up to lean into it? And when do we go like, okay, let's wait until there's something really to get upset about and then we'll get upset. So that's, that's a lot of things I just said. I'm going to let you talk. (laughs) Well, I just want to say I'm so glad Steve's okay. Yeah. And I know you know this, but yes, of course, that it, that all the stuff would get kicked up, you know, and that you mm-hmm. would be worried. And I think part of our conversation, I, I was reflecting on, we want to be aware. We talk about being aware a lot. And then I think there are times when if we're aware all the time of all the things, it's just too overwhelming. Right. And so whatever you did to take care of yourself in the last 24, 48 hours, it's just really understandable. Mm -hmm. Right. Because sometimes we don't want to look at it all. I know I don't. And I had a day on Monday where I was really in touch with like the precariousness (laughs) of some aspects Mm -hmm. of my life. And I was a nervous, I mean, I was really anxious all day. Mm -hmm. Like it was very alive in me all day. And that's, that's rough. And some of that is just the enormity. And so breaking it Mm -hmm. into more manageable pieces, like you don't live your life all at once. You live it one breath at a time, one moment at Mm -hmm. a time. And that is such a good overwhelm tamer, right? To be like, which is what you just said, like what's right in front of me. I don't know if I've ever shared it on the podcast, but I have this little motto that I picked up in my 20s somewhere. Living things first is what I always tell myself. Living things Mm. first. So I would come into my apartment and, you know, was the cat fed? Were the plants watered? And was I fed? And, um, you know, me being taken care of. I may have mentioned Mm -hmm. this before, but like my plants are my barometer. Like when a plant starts dying around here, aside from the fact that, you know, sometimes they do get bugs or die of natural causes but if it's because of neglect like that's Mm -hmm. my little barometer and warning sign so but anyway coming back to like what is the most immediate thing and obviously if I want my plants to live and they're all dried out giving them water is a pretty immediate thing the dog's Mm -hmm. pretty immediate me the kids and it kind of gives me a sense of where to push back and where to say you know okay that'll that appointment can wait until tomorrow Oh, mom's computer, like everything. There's, uh, it can't all happen at once. Right, right. I think too, and I don't know if this is going to take us down another path. We'll see. I don't want it to. I, I'm hoping we can tie it back together. I think we often have these expectations about all the things that we should be doing and the productivity and all these external things of what we need to keep our lives running. And when we don't do those, this sense of, often fear that things are going to fall apart, that we can't manage. And and that could be, we talked about with feelings, but it could be if I talk to you about how I'm feeling, I may fall apart. And yesterday I made a conscious choice that that wasn't going to be helpful. But there are times when that is helpful. And 
if I talk about this feeling, I'm going to come unglued or I'm going to get so depressed that I can't manage. And then that's kind of when we take that beach ball and we're trying to hold the beach ball underwater, all the energy that that takes. And what does it take for us to really let go and go internally to, to check in and see what is it that we're needing and allow ourselves to put something off till tomorrow, to rest, to not be productive. But I think that fear of if I stop exercising, I'm never going to exercise again. Or if I, you know, eat this one thing, then I'm going to start eating everything. Or if I don't clean my room, or if I don't stay on top of things, everything's going to fall apart. And oftentimes we really do need to honor what's going on. And those natural desires will come back. But because we're so driven by these external guidelines, I think it makes it really hard to trust ourselves, our feelings, our needs. And as HSPs, we can be very, very externally focused. And for me, the goal with my clients is what's going on internally? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you needing? And can you trust that and let go of the shoulds? Yeah, not let what we've internalized from society inform that, right? Like really mm -hmm. get with, you know, what do we need? There is so much in what you just said. So many different places we can take that. I'm so glad mm -hmm. we have it recorded because I actually do want to maybe go back and look at it and see all the different prongs because we're going to make a choice right now of which one to follow, which one to talk about. But we mm -hmm. could really go many, many different places with that, with everything that you just said. You'll have to go back and listen because I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will make, have set an intention that I will, and then we'll just see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, you're talking about things that we do, adaptations, fears that we have, shoulds. I'm also a little bit wigged out because I've been seeing clients pretty much nonstop since nine o'clock this morning. And mm -hmm. I'm having this weird moment because I think everything that you and I have started talking about mm -hmm. has threaded through every single client appointment that I had today. Yeah. And that's five hours of seeing clients. So nobody knows when you started and what time it is now, but that's five hours worth of clients that you've oh. been seeing back to back all day. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I love, I love my clients. I love my work and that helps, but I do definitely have some self-care things I can look at with regard to timing. But I just want to go back to what you were saying any little piece of this, like if, so we started off like language matters, right? Mm -hmm. The stories that we tell ourselves matter. Trying to strike this balance of when is it okay to process emotion and when do I just need to shut it down? Right. And I think it all matters. It, it all depends on your context. There are times when it's very adaptive. What I think we want to avoid is overusing any one strategy. I talk about this a lot in my parenting work. Like, you know, there's a time and a place for all sorts of different parenting approaches. But when we only rely on one, it becomes very rigid. So if you only rely on holding that beach ball down under the water and you don't look for opportunities to make space for it to pop up and be processed, then that's probably a problem. And mm -hmm. it's funny because some of what you were saying about productivity, I was having a conversation earlier about internalized capitalism and how insane it is because nothing in nature grows steadily all the time without having a period of rest. And that's destroying us on an individual level, destroying the planet <laughs> at a real mm -hmm. macro level. And I think a lot of our shoulds and a lot of our interpretations and a lot of the stories that we tell ourselves is kind of based in that level of expectation of productivity. And it's just, it's not natural. Perfectionism mm -hmm. is a myth, right? And we have all internalized it. Decontextualized ourselves so we don't, we, we think it's all our fault as opposed to, no, you know what? The reason why I couldn't remember anything yesterday was because I was literally trying to be 15 different places at once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think with HSPs also that because the world is so much about doing and productivity, and HSPs or gifts are often about being how we show up in the world or our empathy, our ability to attune with people, our ability to make those connections, to reflect, to have insight, to make people feel comfortable and to look at where the needs are. And those are, I don't know if it's appropriate or correct to call them soft skills, but they're not as measurable. And 
it's very challenging because we look at what other people are doing. And, you know, I've talked about this, like we're often the emotional glue that holds our families together, our relationships together, but that's not as visible. And it makes it challenging when culturally we're praised for how much we accomplish, but when your gift is how you show up in the world and the presence that you have in this space that you hold for people, that's not as easily measured and that makes it really challenging. Yes. And that's why we have invisible labor, right? Emotional mm -hmm. labor that just we can't mm -hmm. see. And some of us are, yeah, it's underappreciated because it's invisible or mm -hmm. it's not prioritized. I don't know if I've ever talked about it on the podcast, but there is this really cool video on Philosophy Tube about social constructs mm -hmm. and how we kind of collectively were born into a culture that, so it's already been established what's valued and what isn't. And she is just wonderful. I'll, I'll see if I can find a link to it and send it to you for the show notes. Like what is determined to be of value, mm -hmm. right? And what is either marginalized, you know, not like pushed down or, or even disparaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the details I'm thinking that you made two trips to pick up a homework notebook from school to bring a homework notebook back to school, you know, lost rubber bands for the braces. I'm thinking we had dog food that was out with a one third measuring cup and I didn't communicate with my husband and I saw a quarter cup measuring cup in the dog food this morning. And so he's been underfeeding the dog. And those are details that I notice that he doesn't. And those are little things that we hold that don't seem like they're significant. But when you have a handful of all of those details, that also adds to exhaustion and lack of mental clarity because we're holding all these little pieces that are crucial and important, but not we don't wake up and, you know, have on our list, like, I'm going to make a couple trips to and from school today, and I'm going to go to the orthodontist to get rubber bands. And that's extra mental energy and time or coordinating who's going to do that. That adds to this. Yeah, it adds certainly to the mental load. I do love holding everything lightly and with kindness and curiosity. So mm -hmm. as crazy as it was. And the thing is, if you're not locked up in your narrative and in your habitual ways of responding... Because I noticed in the middle of all of that crazy, like I was feeling joy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it also kind of pushed me into leaning in on my community more and reaching out <laughs> to some other right. parents and, you know, who could maybe give my child a ride home while I was taking care of the other one. Doctor's appointments were in there, like all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So it's not, if you're open and curious and not just telling the story about whatever, it is. The thing is, is like our stories really color our moods. Absolutely. Well, what I would imagine is I'm the one that always has to schlep and how come they can't remember? And, you know, why does this always fall on me? Like that would have been an easy narrative to fall into, which you didn't. You didn't. No, I didn't. And yeah. I remember catching that and like, oh, and, and I, I mean, my morning was not without my snapping at <laughs> some children. Mm -hmm. You know, my one child was looking at their phone when I would have much preferred them not to be looking at their phone and mm -hmm. doing something and cooperating and sort of moving with me. But mm -hmm. I wasn't telling a story about it. Like I kind right. of let myself have my a response and then dropped it. And the right. truth was. And so that story would have blinded me, I think, mm -hmm. to the fact that, honestly, my daughter forgetting her homework notebook was partially my fault because <laughs> I was cleaning off the table for dinner. I made a nice dinner last night. Doesn't happen every night. Mm -hmm. And I cleared off the table pretty to go along with said nicely made dinner. And I stuck her, I stuck her book on a shelf. It's so the mm -hmm. first night of homework. So I'm sure that that binder had it been laid out on the table, she probably would have scooped it up. Sure. But if I had run that story and I think I have in the past, I don't know that I would have been as open to that mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. And I also would have missed a beautiful moment because when I went into the gym to pick her up, I'm wearing an orange sweater today, right? And all her little friends are like, you look like a pumpkin, you know, and <laughs> I got to give her a big hug and interact with her classmates, which I never get to do really. And mm -hmm. it was such a moment of sweetness that if I was really locked up in my story, I wouldn't have been there for. Now, the right. day was exhausting. I wouldn't want to necessarily do it again. I want things to go more smoothly in my life for sure. 
but there was joy in there to be had. Which I think is so important because it would be easy to get into the overwhelm or the busyness or whatever historical narratives they, there are, and you didn't. You were able to stay present for all of that. And that means the inconveniences and the beautiful gems. Yeah. And I'm not able to do this all the time. This was as much of a like, wow, <laughs> yeah, kind of a thing for me. But just the fact that I can do it once and if I can do it, anybody can do it. Mm-hmm. And that it's there for us. Yeah. If we can get in right to the moment and to the present moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's mindfulness really because it's without judgment. Right. And it's dropping all the stories, all the things you think you know about what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. We've been talking about, I had a couple of weeks where I didn't paddle for a number of reasons and then I've been tired and haven't gotten back to it. And then I decided to consciously take rolling my kayak off the list of my expectations for the summer. And if I do it, great, but it was adding too much pressure. So this does fit into this whole thing of what do we tell ourselves and what are the narratives? Because I'm having this gremlin (laughs) just talking about what I want to talk about. (laughs) And, you know, it's that sense of using gentleness and compassion. And I was tired and didn't really want to go paddle and go to skills practice. And I decided I'm, I'm not going to do anything that's feeling scary or challenging today. Like I don't have it in me and letting that be okay. And somebody who's spotted me in the past says, hey, I can spot you. I'm like, thanks for the offer. I'm not going to do it. And, and so having that compassion of there are some blocks that I'm having around rolling. Things are feeling scary. There are some things that I think I could do that would make it helpful. And I just don't want to do it. And going, okay, so let's take this off the table so that I'm not having this pressure and feeling bad or guilty or expecting, thinking that people are expecting me to do something or me expecting myself to do something. And how do we use that compassion and gentleness to go like, it's off the table for now. And I'm, and I'm okay with that. And it doesn't even matter if anybody else has a buzz on it because it's none of their business. Not, not that I'm saying that anybody else is judging me, but I think we go to that place where I judge me, you judge me. I imagine that. And again, this is another place where we can use those narratives to say, it's okay for me to be where I'm at and how can I be okay with that and just let that be okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think again, it's like how much we've internalized this must be progressing in positive direction at all time. Taking Mm -hmm. a break feels so scary and threatening. Mm -hmm. That came up today. This fear that if I just really let myself lay on this couch, I am never going to get up. And it's not true. We need the rest. In fact, resting on the couch will probably make it more likely that you'll be able to be fresher and more productive if it's productivity we're talking about or goals or just hopefully it's just the pursuit of our joy. But that feels like a stretch for I know a lot of people and myself at times, right? And I think if we can eliminate this should, if we all could get like a shouldectomy, (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) it would be amazing. Yeah. I've had quite a few people talk about how when all the shoulds, when something took the shoulds away, like Mm -hmm. maybe an illness like COVID or something for a short time and having, you know, well, not that COVID's fun to deal with, but it's qualitatively different when you move through your day without a lot of shoulds. So that was like a challenge thing. Like how often are we shoulding on ourselves, right? And right. even the question, like, what should I do is really not helpful. Like, first mm-hmm. of all, where are you going to find the should? Where, where do you automatically look when you look for this should? Like, often it's not internal, right? It's not, what do I want to do? What would I love to do? What mm-hmm. would sustain me or nourish me right now, right? It's this, what should I do? I guess I think of the S and I think of society. Like, what am I supposed to do? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had clients ask me like, well, what should I feel when they're faced with something? And I'm just like what do you feel? Like that's where the truth is. That's where your life is. Right. And I think oftentimes for yes to mean something, we need to be able to say no. So in my instance, no, I'm not going to expect that I'm going to roll. And then if I want to, I will. No, I'm not going to expect to want a kayak. And then it's interesting that I couldn't go this morning because of my husband's surgery. And then last night I thought, oh, I could go with the evening group tomorrow. And I'm like, where did that come from? Because I've been like, I don't want to paddle. Mm -hmm. And allowing myself to say, it's okay if I don't want to paddle for a while. I mean, I've had this thing of like, what if I stop kayaking? What if I never do it? What if I bought all this equipment? I've been talking about kayaking. It's like, 
then I'll find something else that that's okay. And I've been talking with a friend who's a therapist who's taking some time off and is switching careers, but doesn't know what they're going to do. And is really having guilt around not being productive and not having meaning. And they have a day where they feel great and then they don't feel great. And these are themes about, can I talk to you about kayaking and then decide I don't want to do it anymore? Does that negate anything? No, it just means I've had enough of kayaking and now I'm going to find something else. And is that okay? Yeah. Is it okay to change your mind? Of course. Is it okay to want to do something one day and not want to do it the next? Of course. But I think we have these narratives and these beliefs that once we pick something, we have to stick with it for forever. We can't change our mind. We can't have days where we want to do it. We don't want to do it. And how do we give ourselves that permission to rest in that? I don't want to, this isn't working for me right now. And to let that be okay without having all of the other judgments and things that come in and the shame. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. As you were talking, I was thinking about, and I know I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but Gabor Mate talking about the four things that humans need in development and that none of us really get this, but first one being attachment, right? Belonging, belonging to someone who delights in you, right? Being able to feel the full range of human emotions fully, was the other one rest including resting in the attachment and then the last one is emergent play right play without a purpose play where you just kind of interact with your world and that's the one that was really coming to mind right that when children get too much structured play like play with a point, right? Here's the soccer ball, nothing against soccer. Soccer's awesome, but here's the soccer ball and you need to get it in that goal. And mm-hmm. then if we, if we imprint that as like a recipe for life, right? It's like, okay, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Or mm-hmm. I got to get from here. And that's that like, you know, and then I get better and then I get better and then I get better. And it's not like the play without purpose is so much more exploratory, often more intrinsically motivated and more joyful. And if we imprinted that as a recipe for life, I wonder how much more courageous we would be about uncertainty in the future because there's not this certain, oh, I know exactly what to do. Go get it in the goal, right? So I wonder sometimes like if we can really let ourselves off that hook of always having to know or always having to be. Right. Yes, you start kayaking and you never, <laughs> Patricia, you must kayak for the rest of your life. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, right. maybe you will, maybe you won't. Right. And either way, either one is okay. And in that emergent play is where creativity happens. Yes. You know, we talk about kids need to be bored. They need to have nothing to do so that they get motivated to want to do something. And it's, I think it's harder these days with, I mean, for me, (laughs) with screens, there's entertainment and engagement and you don't have to work so hard to get it. Where as kids, before we had all of these screens, it was so much easier to start building forts out of stuff in the backyard or blankets and pillows or whatever that is. But even for adults, that's where the creativity comes in when we've got space to create. Yes. And to me, creativity also means space to figure it out, to make mistakes, learn what doesn't work, learn what does work, creative problem solving. You know, we all kind of, I think, can pretty readily come up with images and ideas about creativity in childhood. But what would you say creativity, like a really robust creativity would look like in an adult, Mm -hmm. right? I was even like talking about like our toys, like if if the children are told a certain way that they should play with a toy versus like, here you go, do whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. And then they make all sorts of like great things. Like, and, and isn't that kind of that sort of, creative thinking, like really what the world needs. Mm -hmm. I was thinking on Saturday, I got there early with a friend, uh, Annie, who was a kayaker. And she's like, because I told her about the the frustrations that I'm up against. And she says, do you like playing games? I'm like, yeah, you know, sometimes. And and she's like, I'm going to see if I can stand up in my kayak. And she tried it and she fell out and she tried it again and she succeeded. And I thought, "Mm, I'm not going to play that way today, but it was fun watching you. (laughs) <laughs> but that, but that's a perfect example of what you're talking about, of we don't think about standing in kayaks. There's this other guy, Jimmy, that we paddle with, and he stands up and he juggles in his kayak. He's, he's <laughs> hysterical. But, you know, doing things that we don't think of doing with ordinary things, maybe it's juggling lemons when you're in the kitchen and you're getting ready to cook or 
banging on pots with spoons to make a noise. I mean, that's emergent play and creativity coming out that's not a huge thing, but it's just spontaneous. Yes. Yep. And what do we think of adults that are like that sometimes, right? Like, again, like what you should look like, the socially constructed, what's valued. I've been thinking a bit about what sometimes I have difficulty feeling like I'm an adult. Mm -hmm. Right. And what was modeled for me that this is what it meant to be an adult. Right. Right. right? And to have some part of that maybe is to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. You know, parenting's very different now. We model figuring out the answers, not just having the answers. Right. So I don't know. I'm just thinking of, I love those examples of playfulness and fun. And mm -hmm. I mean, what if life is supposed to be that way? I love Alan Watts, right? He says that the, the purpose of life is just to live it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're one of those people right now that's comparing yourself and going, well, I don't do that kind of stuff if I'm not fun. And I chose not to stand up in my kayak and I did not want to get wet on Saturday. I, that was just a choice that that's okay. But I think that there are ways that we can find to be creative and spontaneous that don't have to look like standing up in your kayak and falling in the water. You know, there are ways that we can do it that honor ourselves. But I think because we tend to be oftentimes more serious and more mature and sometimes less playful for whatever reasons. I think we have this judgment and constraint. Like when I used to ask people, what do you do for play? And it's like, I read or I, you know, we think it's supposed to be loud, extroverted, gregarious, physical activity with lots of people. And it could just be playing with inks or colors or music or plants or watching a bird or that sense of creativity and connection with nature doesn't have to be our typical extroverted sense of what play and fun looks like. No, not so. at all. In fact, that's part of the very problem, right. right? Is that we don't have a wide variety of ideas about how adults can show up playful and creative. Right. Right. Yeah. I think asking the question is so great. Like what, yeah. what else could that look like? Yeah. Okay, so Jen, you, you can listen back to this episode and get all the topics and we'll come back and revisit them. And if we don't, it's okay. I just know I will not go back and listen to things. It just won't. So that's I often my limitation. Don't, but yeah, I don't know. I just, <laughs> oh, gosh, my brain split in like 15 different directions. And I was like, oh, I can't chase all of these rabbits at once. I was just impressed you can name them off. I did write some of them down. So I can take a screenshot and send that to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we are out of time. So we're going to wrap this up. Is there anything else before we end, Jen? I just want to say thank you so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for being here. All right. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye, dear. Bye. Hey, again. So how was that episode for you? What I was thinking is, you know, you can make a list of what are the things that you would love to do? Just brainstorm things that you miss doing, things that you love doing as a child and see if those are things that you can do again, or are those elements in those that it may not be about the literal activity, but what you got out of the activity. I know I've talked about this before, but there's something about touching dogs. <laughs> and the morning of Steve's surgery, I was doing water, I go to water fitness, and it's interesting, I passed these two dogs walking from my car to the pool, and one of the dogs kind of walked over to me and it was a beautiful Akita and I just needed to touch it. And for some reason, spending time with animals and cuddling them is incredibly satisfying for me. And one of you wrote into me and said that you have that same thing too. So I'm not alone in this. But the other thing that you can do is when we were talking about what are the stories that you have or the narratives that you have and do you overlay that? So some of my wounded narratives are, I'm the only one. I can't count on anybody. People don't show up for me. It's easier if I just do it myself. I can't count on people. That is not the reality. But if I'm aware that those are what my wounded narratives are, that when I'm feeling activated like I was the other day or feeling overwhelmed, there's too much, I can't do it, I can't figure it out, that I can see, am I seeing this through those lenses and having Jen and people to help connect me when I was feeling dysregulated really makes a difference. So you can look at what are some of your wounded narratives and where do those come into play? Because it's easy when our feelings are heightened that we're having intense feelings, but 
the meaning that we attach to it may not always be accurate. And recently I've been telling you about feeling tired. And after I had my COVID booster, I just had been in a very quiet place. And I kept thinking like, am I depressed? And it's like, I don't think so. I'm getting up in the morning. I'm doing my self-care. I'm taking care of the pets. I'm eating. I'm staying connected to my friends. I just am in more of a quiet mood and really enjoying this series Heartland that I'm watching and I think it was a time to pull inward and just replenish. And so much of what is expected of us or what we think we need to do is to be expending energy by connecting with people and doing things. And sometimes we just need to kind of fill up and build up our reserves. And if I didn't have that awareness, I could have gone into a narrative of I'm depressed and what's wrong with me. And it's like, I'm just kind of quiet and that's what I need. And so are you giving yourself permission or what are you telling yourself if you're wanting or needing something and not allowing yourself to have it. And I recognize that not everybody has the privilege of taking time to care for themselves. If you've got jobs and partners and you're caring for children or parents or siblings, or I recognize that we don't always have the luxury of time, but I think even that shift in how we're talking about it and thinking about it can really make a difference. I hope you found this helpful. My hope is that this gives you some hope and encouragement and doesn't create more overwhelm for you. If you're interested in working with either Jen or myself, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to Jen at Jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com. You can reach out to me at unapologetically sensitive.com. Both of us would love to work with you. I think that's all I have. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's your superpower. Have a blessed day.